very much, Aaron. Um, yeah, thank you. And, and I am going to be speaking mostly about uh, open textbooks, and that's sort of the primary context here for this. But I think some of the discussion uh, we could extrapolate out to uh, uh, to more broadly open education resources. Um, uh, my name is Eric Frank. I'm co-founder and president of Flat World Knowledge, and I'm going to start the session by providing a about a 10-minute overview of Flat World Knowledge's commercial business model around open, uh, and particularly around uh, publishing openly licensed textbooks. Uh, and from there, what we'll do um, is move into sort of a uh, discussion mode. So I've sort of prepared five um, assumptions, mini assumptions, and a little bit of data, one to two minutes of additional data around each of those, and then, and then just open up and engage in a conversation uh, around those. Um, but we can change the agenda a little bit on the fly if we want to. I think the most important thing in these questioning our assumptions uh, sessions is that uh, we actually end up having some fruitful conversation that, that yields something useful <laughs> for people when we walk out of the room. So the way I prepared it may not be the way we want to ultimately do it. And this is Nicole Allen. Uh, she's with the uh, Student uh, Public Interest Research Group and she'll be taking notes and, and building our uh, report back for the group. Um, oops. Basically, uh, uh, we started Flatworld Knowledge about uh, four years ago uh, because of this. And we just thought it's, a, it's an extremely dissatisfied, deep and sustained deep dissatisfaction in the college textbook publishing industry. Um, students are clearly angry uh, about the cost of materials, um, frustrated about the lack of options that they have in the marketplace to solve that, that problem. I think faculty are affected deeply uh, by the student cost side problem, uh, but are also frustrated by their own problems. Uh, they, they want to be able to basically stop teaching around a textbook and actually have a textbook better aligned with what they want to teach, uh, but it's a static black box and they can't do it uh, and take advantage of its full capacity to be part of the uh, integrated curriculum. Um, authors only get paid uh, royalties when new textbooks are sold. Uh, in the industry, and every year less new textbooks are sold in favor of students renting textbooks, buying used textbooks, sharing textbooks legally, illegally sharing textbooks. Uh, and so author royalties have been sort of eroding year on year. Um, and then ultimately, colleges themselves have historically stayed away from textbook issue uh, and said it's a faculty issue. Uh, but it increasingly, as it's important for them to increase graduation rates, and generally with less public funding, if you're at a public institution, um, they're now looking at textbooks a bit more strategically and saying, wow, these are actually working against our mission. Uh, they're, they're, they're actually forcing students to uh, drop out of courses, uh, and they're making it difficult for us to achieve our public mission. Uh, and so basically, nobody's happy. Uh, and so into that environment, uh, we decided to launch a uh, commercial open textbook publishing company. And it was really around four critical bets that we made. Uh, the first bet was that we had to have exceedingly high quality and in turnkey quality. That it had to be something easily adoptable and it had to be a very high quality product for a faculty member to adopt it. And then if it wasn't, if they felt like it was a significant step back from where they were, then we would be doomed to the fringes of the marketplace. Um, the second bet that we made was control that faculty wanted control. They are the local expert. They know their students, they know the topic, they know the subject, and if you could pass legal control and practical control for them to be able to manipulate and adapt and change a textbook, then you would lead to a more relevant and better learning product. Uh, the third one is that students wanted choices. Some students want to read in print, some students want to listen, some students want to read on a device, some students want to read on a computer, and they ought to be able to read in the way that best suits their learning style and their lifestyle. And then ultimately, we could leverage innovative business models and technology to do all of that at a dramatically lower cost per student and, and, and basically solve the cost problem in the textbook market. And so those were the four bets that we made uh, around building a, an open textbook publishing company. Um, but just a little bit more detail on each. By quality, I just mean we actually chose to pursue uh, textbook publishing in a fairly traditional way. We go out, we, we identify and recruit who we think is the top author, the leading scholar or teacher in their field. They write a textbook for us uh, under a contract. Um, we develop it with editors and, and illustrators and, and other uh, professional development and do extensive peer review in a fairly traditional peer review process. And ultimately, we build uh, uh, packages, supplements for faculty uh, so that the whole process is very turnkey uh, in terms of adoption for faculty. 
So in that regard, we're no different than a publisher. We're no better either. We're just on the playing field at that point. Where we start to differentiate ourselves uh, from that playing field is this transfer of control. And we do that two ways. Obviously, uh, the first is via an open license. Now, we use a uh, buy and see SA license, and we can talk about that a little bit later in more detail. Um, but in essence, that's the open license that we've chosen to use for our textbooks. Uh, I'm not going to explain what that means because I think everyone in this room understands it. Um, but we also said if people are going to really take advantage of, of what open licenses legally enable them to do, they're going to need a platform to do it. If, if I handed someone a textbook, whether it was physical or digital, and said, here, you have the legal right to change this, everyone would say, that's great. Then they'd sit down at their desk and they'd go, what do I do to it? How do I change it? What, if it's a PDF, if it's a print book, what do I do to this thing? So we built a platform called Mio, or Make It Your Own, uh, for them to be able to do that. Uh, just to give you a brief uh, uh, example so you can get your head around it, uh, this is a psychology book in our catalog. Uh, anybody in the world could click read this book online now, and it's free. Um, so everybody here could read the psychology book during the session if you get bored. Um, and you could click customize this book. And you enter an editing environment. It's a cloud-based editing environment where you can now rearrange contents, edit, contents, insert contents, and basically make it your own. Um, and just a few examples, so if I want to reorganize, I literally just click and drag and drop sections and chapters anywhere else into the table of contents uh, where I want them. Um, frequently, uh, faculty don't want to cover all the material in the book, now you can just delete it with a click of the trash can, and it's gone. And if I wanted to edit something, I want to go into this experience of emotion section 10.1, I simply click it and load up that section of content. And by clicking on any element in the section, I can now edit it. Uh, I can insert new objects like new paragraphs, bulleted lists, numbered lists, annotations, exercises. I can upload documents like Word or PDF documents. Uh, I can insert video clips uh, into the textbook. And I can edit existing content. So if I click on a paragraph, I open up a web editing toolbar. Uh, I can change things. I can insert links out to the web. Um, you know, I was at a talk at University of New Hampshire last night where they're slowly swapping out examples and using examples from the regional uh, Durham, New Hampshire area in business textbooks uh, as an example. So, um, uh, so you have that level of control. And ultimately I can create new content. So let's say I wanted to uh, make this the freshest, most current uh, textbook I can during the semester and I want to talk about uh, what's going on in the Middle East and what happens so psychologically to a society when a society erupts in protest. And does it have a long-term effect, short-term effect, no effect? So I want to put that in my book. So I create, make a new section, uh, type in the psychology of protest for my section, save it, uh, and then I just start adding content. I can cut and paste. Uh, some learning objectives in here, or I could type them in using the editor. Uh, I could insert a paragraph uh, into the textbook. Uh, I can go ahead and insert a video. So in this paragraph, I talk about watching the Egyptian protests of 2011 and look out for certain things. So I insert a video using a video toolbar where you can insert videos from YouTube or Blip TV uh, by inserting URLs, providing a description and a citation. And you click save, and then I'll finish my section by adding some exercises about the video and call it a video comprehension check. And what's nice is once you click save, it instantly takes that material and formats it to look exactly like the rest of the book. So it applies the design and the style of the textbook to all of your new materials so that you have a, a seamless, it's adapted, it's a derivative, but a seamless uh, new uh, product that, that looks and feels like a textbook. And when you click publish it, I'm ready, I'm done, I've made changes for my class, I'm ready for my students to have at this material, I click publish. And what our system is doing in the background, we basically started with the expert book, we used Mio to edit it, now we move into an automated publishing environment. And what happens is, automatically, in the database, everything is renumbered, so all the figures, the page numbers, uh, 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 tables, charts, everything renumbers, table of contents reorders, the index rebuilds, so everything that you moved, every page reference gets updated on the fly. Uh, and then within a few minutes, we generate all these different file formats. HTML, uh, PDF, EPUB, Mobi, which is for Kindles, uh, DAISY readable files, and BRF files, uh, uh, which are uh, um, uh, digital braille files. And, uh, and we don't actually generate an MP3 on the fly, but we do basically remove anything you deleted from that mp3 and we actually reorganize the mp3 file based on your changes. If you've added content, we're not yet doing text to speech to create an mp3 on the fly, although that's coming. Uh, it's just I don't think the tech is quite there yet. 
And ultimately, what does all that do? It allows students to consume in the way that they want to. They can consume through any um, browser uh, over the internet. They can choose to use the PDF file to either we generate a soft cover uh, via a print-on-demand partnership with RR Donnelly uh, and ship it to bookstores or to students where they can download and print the PDF themselves. Uh, they can obviously put it on a device. They can use EPUB files to put on just about every reader to take advantage of the innate reader functionality. The Kindle uh, has a proprietary format. And then naturally, students who have print disabilities are the ones taking advantage of the accessible formats. Uh, and then obviously, audiobooks one is listening to. Um, one of the key problems that we felt like we had to solve is uh, in, in, in open source software, I think one of the greatest challenges in, in using open source software as a, as a user, for example, at our company is, you know, you've got this, this canon out there, this code base, and you say, that's great, I want to use it, I, I want to use that CRM system to manage our customer data, but I want to use it openly, I want to use an open one because I want to make modifications to it, and I want to improve the workflow for our business. And so you go and you do all that. And then they come out with the next big version of that CRM, and you're stuck. You're on an island. You've got all your stuff changed. It's not upgrade safe. You can't merge those two things. And now I'm, I'm owning a CRM. I don't want to be in the CRM business. I don't want to have to maintain it. And I like some of the new stuff they did in the, the new code base, but I can't access it. And I think we're doomed in this movement if ultimately we ask faculty to make adaptations and derivatives and, and basically fork them onto an island away from the original. And now they say, well, wait a minute, I don't want to maintain this whole textbook. I just wanted to add these three new sections on topics I care a lot about, or these, these, these references. So we actually felt like before we really launched this, we had to solve that problem. And so we've done that. Um, we've basically built technology on the back end that says, hey, um, we in essence treat everything like a bunch of database objects. And if you add material, you're just adding objects into the database. And when you make changes, we're just actually not changing files. We're adding transparencies. Think of them as like transparencies. If you added a word to your book, it's like the original book sitting there in the database, and you add your transparency with your word on top of it. And when we render it out to all those formats, we render the original and insert your new word in there. Um, and so what we're able to do is if everybody in this room had a derivative, um, and I publish a second edition of the core textbook, or our author does, I can generate a delta report for each of you that says, hey, here's the difference between your derivative and my second edition, and I do have a choice as a customer. You can either reject mine entirely, I like mine, be yours better, you're happy, fine. You can say, you know what, let me take, take yours en masse, I don't care about my changes anymore, you've done a better job. Or you can merge and see the conflicts, and merge them individually and say, you know what, I like what you did here, I like what I did there, and you can merge it and end up with a common textbook. And I think in many ways that's a, um, a problem that had to be solved to get scale uh, around use and adaptation and, and open. Um, the, the last piece of that model then is choice and cost. I already described how we produce all those different formats for students. Um, basically, this is what students are doing today. That web version that you saw is free, um, so that's our free through the browser version to anybody in the world. 44% of students today are taking advantage of free only. In the classroom, 56% are buying uh, something, and they're basically buying in these percentages across those, uh, those formats. Um, we're seeing some change in this each semester, primarily some decline in print and some increase in ebooks as the base of e-readers on campus grows slowly. Um, and that, that trend, I think, will continue. So we're as estimating about $80 per student savings. Even if you take a traditional book and give that, that book the benefit of the doubt of new books, rented books, used books, uh, everything else, the blended average spend is about $100 per student per class. With Flat World, it ends up as a blended average of $20 per student per class when you blend free and paid readers together. Um, so some quick snapshot of results as a, as a company. Uh, how are we doing building a sustainable model around this? Um, we've got 135 authors under contract, um, and so that represents about 65 uh, unique titles right now. Um, 50 of them published and some more just about to hit. Um, we've done about $3 million in licensing deals with colleges. I haven't actually talked about this part of our model, but in addition to individual faculty adopting and students coming along and choosing, um, which is where we have 3,000 individual formal faculty adopters today. Um, and we launched our first book in spring 09. So from spring 09 to today, 3,000 individual faculty, about 270,000 students in those classes. 
Um, but we've also licensed our, our portfolio of content to an institution, uh, and they can pay us for access to that portfolio of content. And we've got about $3 million in those licensing deals done in the past um, year and a half. So we are generating real revenue around an open textbook model. Uh, we've raised about $30 million in venture capital, so I think it says there's some capital out there that sees there an opportunity uh, around uh, open models, uh, and commercial open models in particular. Um, and what's interesting is we have some key uh, venture capital backers, Bessemer Venture Partners, for example, is a top 10 global VC firm. But maybe more interesting is, is Bertelsmann, uh, the world's largest privately held media company, and Random House, the world's largest publisher, are both investors in flat world. And I think that's an indication that you're starting to see some bifurcation in that publishing industry, right? And some players saying this might be a way in against the old guard. And, and I think you're starting to see some real stirring up of uh, some interest in, in open models as potentially a way to get in and, and beat the big card players at their own game. Um, uh, Outsell is a media industry and analyst group. They provide uh, analysis and data to Wall Street about important trends. And every year they publish a 30 companies to watch list about companies that are doing things that are disrupting uh, an industry. And, and this year we were on that one of those 30 companies along with Apple, Facebook, Google, Thomson Reuters, and a few other little companies. Um, but again, significant. And then it says uh, people are watching this and saying this is real uh, and this has real scale potential. And then ultimately, in conclusion, um, this is probably the most important result of everything which is we're starting to get data back, and it's incremental, and it's not yet, I don't think, a story that, that I feel we can credibly tell in the marketplace. We're getting close. Um, where, where users who switch from proprietary textbooks to open textbooks, flat-world open textbooks, are starting to see real, substantive, data-driven improvements in student performance, um, particularly in course completion rates, where they're seeing rate rises from 10 to 20% on the number of courses who actually complete a course, uh, when they get rid of the prohibitive uh, textbook and uh, actually seeing some increases in grade point averages as well. Uh, and so we're actually seeing costs come down and student performance go up and that's a huge winning formula for I think the open textbook uh, movement. And, and I gave a talk in New Hampshire and I put this in there last night because um, the talk I was giving in University of New Hampshire was about technology and business. And what I wanted to remind students was it's not about technology, it's about people. And at the end of the day, uh, I just, every day, I, I remind myself that there are people like Shannon. So we ran a Facebook uh, um, uh, campaign and asked students, if you save money on textbooks, what would you do with it? And we had thousands of, of students write in, but Shannon was particularly moving for me, which is I have four kids, I'm in college full time, it leaves little money for extras. If I save the money, I'd give my daughter an awesome sixth birthday party. Uh, this September. She was willing to settle for dinner at McDonald's and candy bar as a gift because she said Chuck E. Cheese's is too much money. She deserves more than that. And that's, I mean, there's just tens and thousands, hundreds of thousands of Shannons out there. Um, and I think that uh, entrepreneurship has an opportunity and open in concert with entrepreneurship to solve uh, that problem. And the dean at Virginia State said it the best when she said, our students have always had the ability and the intellect. Now with open textbooks, they finally also have the resources. Um, Oops. So with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude sort of the overview of Flat World and um, move into the sort of discussion piece. Um, so the, the big assumption here uh, that, that we're supposed to be debating is, is whether commercial activity is, is counter to the goals of OER or to the OER movement in particular. This is kind of a big assumption, so I thought I'd hold this one for a bit. Maybe that could be the last thing that we spend some time talking about and tackle some smaller pieces of this. Um, so this is, this is an assumption I hear frequently. You know, there's plenty of con open content out there. The problem isn't, you know, uh, it's, it's not on the supply side. Um, and there's sort of, a, I think, generally a view that if we build open content, and we put it somewhere uh, in a place that's findable on scale that masses of people will come and use it. And frequently, uh, I think we're, we're disappointed uh, in, the, in the results. Um, so I just wanted to give one quick snapshot of something that I think is kind of sobering, um, but then discuss that a little bit, which is, and sorry, it's kind of a hard to read slide, but this is a quick snapshot of what we do when we publish a textbook. So we, we take a textbook, we get it done, assuming it's from a leading scholar, uh, it's been vetted, the quality's good. We do a bunch of indirect marketing. 
We do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer stuff to help uh, people pass the word along to other people, provide them with tools, social media, uh, to, to refer Flat World to other professors. We do a tremendous amount of public relations work so that we get coverage uh, around stories related to uh, open textbooks. Um, we do lots of webinars over the web to faculty presenting uh, open textbooks in the model. We show up at lots of conferences, right? So we're talking to lots of faculty. We do a lot of direct marketing. Um, so every time we publish a book, we lease the data of all the faculty who teach that course around the United States. We publish a book in advertising. We lease 2,100 <coughs> faculty names. We load them into a CRM. We get their contact information uh, from a firm in India who loads up all that email and contact information. We launch really sophisticated email campaigns with lots of data-driven activity behind it. We do direct mail to faculty uh, to make them aware of our offerings. We do <coughs> review copies for free. We have to send out expensive print books and spend $200,000 a year sending out print books to faculty. We need to review in print. We have sales tools for sales reps. We do retargeting campaigns. So if you show up at Flat World site today and then you go to Zappos tonight to buy shoes, you're probably going to see an ad for your Flat World book on your Zappos site saying, come back and, and check out the free textbook. Um, uh, we do lots of, all that stuff comes to our web and we spend a lot of time on our website basically uh, getting faculty to convert from an anonymous visitor to a lead. So we know who a lot of them are when they click on an email, but a lot of people come from PR, let's say, or from a peer, we don't know who they are. So we offer them things, whether it's downloadable white papers and traditional sort of lead gen strategies. We generate leads, we score them, we pass them to an inside sales group. Those inside sales people call them back. We have some outside sales people out doing bigger committee presentations. We spend a lot of time optimizing all that. Uh, we do that. Um, uh, we, then we have to close them. We have to provide tools for them to adopt on the site, to provide information to their bookstores, uh, to provide ISBNs for them to be able to do this, to get them the supplements in a seamless way uh, so that they have it, get them information to give their students in a seamless way, uh, and all that has to be instant and, and, and many, much of it automated. We have to run student e-commerce to be able to convert students from free readers to paid readers. Uh, and lots of different ways we do that. And ultimately, we have to take care of customers who adopt. They expect help. They expect someone to talk to, to answer questions. So for big customers, we have this white glove customer service, and they have an account manager who takes good care of them. For everybody else, they have uh, access to email, phone, and, and live chat on our website so they can communicate with customer service. That's a snapshot of what we do. And when that's all said and done, 12 months after we publish a book, we're at about 3% market share. 3% of the faculty in a course who could be using a flat world book are using one. And that's actually a success. I mean, because we know we're going to keep building on that. But that's where we are. So I, that's a little sobering snapshot of the if we build it, they will come. Uh, because I, I, maybe I'm wrong, and that's the, that's the part that's open for debate. Uh, maybe we're doing something wrong, um, or maybe they won't come, or maybe, I don't know. <laughs> so, so let's stop on that one for a minute and just talk about um, other people's experiences here, um, both supporting of this concept that maybe they won't, refuting it, saying no, I think that we, we can get people to come, some of what you've seen, any research you can think of. Yeah? Hi, my name's Amber Harkowski, and I actually use your um, Steiner uh, psychology book. I'm here with the Kaleidoscope project. Oh, great. Um, and ironically enough, a couple of weeks ago, I had a nice visit from our textbook uh, sales rep where we usually get our intro to psych book, and I'm the only psych faculty that's using it right now because it's part of a grant. And he had a lot of questions for me, and he seemed a little defensive. Um, and he you know, wanted to ask me, he's like, I'm not, he's like, I'm not trying to debate you, but he's asking me, and I was very open, I told him all about it, and, and I personally am not married to any textbook. As long as it's decent, you know, I'm a good, I think I do a good job teaching the content. It's pretty much the same regardless. As long as it's decent content. Um, but I teach at a community college, and access to me, for me is very important. I have students that will try to go the whole semester without buying any textbooks because they can't afford to buy textbooks. So I think access is really important. Um, the only thing I'm concerned about is once the grant's over and um, you know I, I don't necessarily have to use it, I would like to continue using it, and I think my college will be supportive even though everyone in the psych department is supposed to use the same textbook, which is a traditional textbook. Um, you know, how would you deal with that? Um, also, this sales rep was talking to me about all these you know, bundle packages and cool things they're doing. Um, but I asked, well, how much does that cost? And there's no free option on any of what he's trying to tell me. So to me, it doesn't compete. Um, so I don't know, how would you... Well, it's a, yeah, I mean, uh, the, I call that the FUD factor, which is the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. 
uh, and we get that all the time. That's the other challenge, right? Even after all this, if you're in the 3% who adopt it, you're inevitably getting visited from your Pearson or McGraw-Hill or Wiley sales rep who's going to spend the next 12 months instilling FUD in you. <laughs> um, because that's their job, right? And, and, and it's not an easy answer. I mean, I think that to some degree, um, numbers start to matter, so where you can start to go to a website, and on our site we list all the schools using the book and say to your colleagues, look, <laughs> there's 150 other schools doing this now, we're not, we're not outliers, you know, we're not sitting out here, um, you know, one of the reasons that it's so important to us to have someone like Charles Stangor as an author is he's got, you know, 75 refereed articles published, he's the head of, uh, he's the editor of two or three significant journals in the field. It's not like he's got a, a best-selling uh, upper-level book with Pearson. Uh, you know, you're dealing with very credible uh, uh, authorship and content. Um, but I think you, the, the reality is you kind of have to have that, you have to stand that ground, right? And you have to say, look, I mean, it, one of the, the um, conversations I had recently with someone, was we were talking to this fact, and I said, look, with all due respect, I understand some of the topic issues you're raising. But let me ask you a question. You're looking for this perfect textbook that's got everything just the way you want it. And you find it and you adopt it. And right now, statistics are telling me that 50% of your students aren't reading it. They're not buying it because it's too expensive. 50%. So, so you, you put those two things on a scale. 100% of your students having access to a book that's slightly less than perfect for you. Or 50% having access to the perfect book. And where are you going to get better learning outcomes? And that changes the debate some, right? Because that access question is indeed a critical first step for students in community colleges and state colleges towards being successful. Uh, and so I think some of these arguments we just have to sort of hold the line and, and argue and, and win <laughs> on. Yeah, Gabe? Well, well, when it comes to numbers, right? One, numbers in community colleges in particular that are very compelling are the cost savings for the students. So you know what the textbook is that your site department does and there's a cost on that thing. Right. And you know how many students go to your section and you know how many sections you teach. So you can put, there's a delta in between what they were spending for that, that McGraw Hill site textbook and what they're spending for the flat roll book. I know some of your students probably are using the free version online mm -hmm. and there's a, the delta there is 100% difference in cost and there's some of your students that are buying some of the derivative works that they sell. I mean that's a, that's a smaller savings. But one thing that you might think about and maybe working with Eric and his team is how do you get, how do you capture that? Because if you can go, if you can say to your students, you know, on average, students who come to this site class, you know, spend this much as compared to what you spend in the others. And then how many, how many students do you teach a quarter, for example, in this class? I have like five sections of interest, like 30 students each. So you're teaching 150 students every quarter. Yeah. Those are big numbers. Right. Right, so, and your, your dean is going to be hard pressed, or your department chair, to say, yes, I'm sorry that you, I mean, I'm glad you saved 50,000 students for the community college students, but you still have to go back to the other book, mm -hmm. right? Make them say that publicly. Yeah. That's actually, I'll, I'll say one other thing, and I want to come over here. I, another faculty member who I was with last night in New Hampshire teaches at three other schools as an adjunct, and he uses flat world books everywhere. And, and what he said was, I'm literally getting students looking at my syllabus, seeing that I'm using a free book, and coming to my sections, and not enrolling in others, and it's creating market pressure on my peers, and it's increasing my value. Because I, I can only be valued on the enrollments that I'm bringing into my sections. And I think those market forces are critical. Once we get enough footholds in places, students are going to begin to respond to that, and it's going to become a challenging environment for people wanting to stay with $200 textbooks, so long as the quality alternative is there. Yeah, we have a question, or a point here, and then over here after. I am from the Netherlands, and we are running a national program to mainstream OER in the country in all the educational sectors. We started the program in 2009, and from the beginning we were very keen on having a good relationship with the education publishers, which are very strong in our country, as you may realize. And uh, so they just had to join uh, this project because it was a national project. Still, it, it's, it, it appears to be very difficult because those are traditional educational publishers, and they have this, this idea that OER is only uh, something like an add-on on, let's say, the, the nice uh, high quality methods that they are producing. So my question is the following. Do you have any idea, suppose that all the traditional publishers are gone, and they're, all, they're only flat world knowledge use, uh, like, like you are, the total business, how much would it be of the business that the, the, present, the, the current publishers are running? 
Well, is it fifty percent or twenty-five or, or something. Yeah, it's a good. What it's a good it question. I mean, I, so you know, there's two ways to look at that. So, like in the U.S., the higher ed textbook market, about eight and a half billion dollars being spent in higher ed on textbooks. But there's a big non-consumer market, right? About forty percent of students who aren't buying because they 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 they've been priced out of the market, um, and another ten percent who choose not to buy for other reasons. Um, so that's the size of the market. Now we're generating in a single year about. Um, uh, probably 20% of the revenue that a, a traditional publisher would be. Um, and what we do differently is we get it more consistently. So one of the challenges for a publisher is high investment in a book and product, right? Get it out there in the market and then sell it in the first year and then watch the second, third, fourth years tail off in sales because of used books and other versions. And then it spikes up again the, the next time they bring out a new edition. So they watch their revenue line go like this where we're lower but steadier. So by the end of four semesters or two full years, we're almost equal in terms of revenue we've generated based on the same investment in the same textbook. So in the end, we've said if we were, if the world were absolutely out there uh, consistently with flat worlds instead of Pearsons of the world, we probably would see average student spend be somewhere around twenty dollars a course, and we, we're currently estimating that at a hundred dollars a course. So it would be about 20% of the total market. It would be a big shrinking marketplace in terms so of dollars. A, that's the fudge factor for the publisher. Right, right? Yeah. absolutely. Okay. I mean, that's, that's absolutely the nightmare scenario for a publisher. Uh, I'm in a bit of an awkward situation. Next week I'm doing a presentation on OER at a conference for the State University of New York. The conference is on e-books and OER, and it's being underwritten in part by Flatway for $500 by Hill for $1,000 and by Pearson for $1,000. <laughs> um, so I'm a little, a little nervous about sure. that reaction. But what I'm wondering about is, do you think that this is a model that the traditional textbook companies may begin to adopt for part of Yeah. Them? Look, I think if you look at the software industry, I'll answer that two ways. One is, uh, somebody, I can't remember who did, wrote a nice article showing that they, they go through sort of the typical uh, psychological uh, stages of development in response to into the open source software movement, right? First is anger. How can you do this, right? You're devaluing, you know, code and everything else. And then there's denial. It's not going to stay. It's going to die after a while. And then there's sort of this acceptance, like it's it's here, but I'm not embracing it. I'm not helping it, and I'm not doing it. And then eventually there's sort of all right, <laughs> it's not going away. Uh, I have a business to operate. Uh, I could cut my nose to spite my face, so I could figure out how to accommodate my business model to, to benefit from this. And I do think um, we're going to see all of that, you know. And and one of the ways that I talk about this with some of my peers in the publishing industry, because I was director of marketing at Pearson, I got lots of friends in the industry. Uh, we try to separate personal and professional, but there's a lot of animosity about what we're doing. And one of the things I say to them is, look, um, if you're so good at what you do, you shouldn't be threatened by this. This is just competition. And if the value that you're adding is worth the money that you're charging, then consumers will continue to buy that. That's called enterprise. That's called free markets. And, and, and if what you're afraid of is that you're not adding enough value anymore, and you're going to have to drive your costs down, then you have a problem in your business. And it's good for you that I'm making you figure that out, right? And I actually say um, that, you know, it, Cable and I were having a conversation about this this morning. Publishers should actually uh, embrace this. Right, we, we do see, I heard an NPR story last night about this partnership for malaria drug that came out between uh, the Gates Foundation, Glaxo, SmithKline, an advocacy organization, some government organizations in Africa, right? And, and it's a model of successful malaria drug development. And the question was, is this a new model? That was what the, uh, the, the, the host of the show was asking. And the person on the show said, no, this model was around 20 years ago, very successfully, went away for a while, but now it's coming back. It's a good partnership for drug companies to rely on other sources of funding to do really risky early R&D development and then embrace it and take it to market. And so publishers could think about open educational resources the same way, that here's all of this material bubbling up. It's not generally polished for market. It's not intended to be to go through that process that I described, and that's an opportunity for publishers to, to take a lot of that, save a lot of money on failed stuff that they might have done, pick out the really good stuff that's already getting some traction, and then make it better, and then add value to it. And some of that's going to work successfully for them, and some of it isn't, but I think in the end, that's, that's the way this market's going to function is increasing competition, and, they, and I think they'll respond and adapt and find models to incorporate. Um, so so contrast that real quickly, yeah. what you just said, 
with the way the publishers are acting with the legislation that we discussed this morning. Mm -hmm. So what they're doing initially, they're in the denial, I have maybe the anger stage, right, trying to stop this from happening. So do you want to give a quick synopsis of that? No, go ahead. All right, so basically there's a, um, some, some, a policy out there that's being uh, uh, promoted, right, a government policy that says, hey, if it's publicly funded, uh, it should be accessible to the public under an open license, a CC by license. Simple idea, simple policy, almost every citizen that pays taxes agrees with it. Um, the publishers have inserted language into that uh, I'm saying basically that's fine so long as the Secretary of, of in this case, Labor, because uh, it's the Department of Labor providing $2 billion in funding for creation of materials that have to be openly licensed, so long as the Secretary does an in, in-depth market analysis and certifies that whatever it is that's being created and paid for by public funds doesn't yet exist or isn't in development at a commercial publishing company first. Uh, and it's not just it's product, a service, uh, and so it's this really broad language that says basically uh, we want to push out any competition from open. We don't view it today as raw materials for us to improve, and we don't view it as healthy competition, obviously. But I think in the end, that's just anti-competition. That's what they're concerned about. Um, and so I think you can play this as, look, this should be good for you. You should embrace this option. Um, you could lay out the alternative option for a publisher, but fundamentally, at the end of the day, it's all right, let's have a public debate about whether public goods paid for by the public should be available freely to the public, and, and actually turn around and say, all the materials developed under government funding have to be used first, and only after you do that exhaustive search can you turn to a commercially available good. And that's, that's the, those are two diametric opposites, but that's the debate we're gonna end up in, unless there's some collaboration. Uh, let's go there and then in the back. So $15 million in VC funding, $3 million a year, million, yeah. and, and, and doing quite well. That's, that's excellent. What possible chance to, do, do the nonprofits that are trying to get OER adopted have if, if with all your funding you're getting 3%? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think it depends on purpose and goal too, right? So we, we have a very specific goal, which is take an open textbook that we make and displace the use of an existing traditional proprietary book. Um, you know, th there's lot, there are lots of content uh, repositories in areas where there's lots of use and traffic. It's just a different customer, right? It might be an informal learner. Uh, it might be a formal learner supplementing their learning with an open resource. And, and it's sl and slowly growing in the, in the sort of mainstream adoption space. So uh, one thing is define your goals, right? It, it may be that, that you can drive lots of traffic um, uh, for a particular learner type if displacement of existing isn't your objective. Um, if it is your objective, uh, I, don't, I don't know. It's a, it's a hard answer. I mean, I think um, part of this is a bit about staying power because I think that we're starting to establish credibility. Some funding coming from the government is starting to create more materials and better materials and there's starting to be some uh, some processes on top of those projects that are leading to better better stuff. We're starting to see some data saying when you make these open materials available to students, results are better. Um, so I think that part of it's just about staying power because it's been 10 years in the coming, but the, it's quickening. And the pace of, of adoption is accelerating. Um, and so it's not a satisfying answer. Uh, I don't know if any, maybe someone else has an answer to that question, which which is how can nonprofits uh, uh, continue to sustain themselves and and, and get the kind of penetration we need. So I'll, I'll let someone else answer that, but we'll go back here for a second. So, for, in full disclosure, I work for a large traditional textbook company, Cengage. I have no idea if my employer was one of those lobbying for Congress, and I won't defend it. Uh, but I will say, and it, partly an answer to the last concern is, uh, is to echo what you said, which is this exact conversation went on about open source 10 years ago um, with people desperately hoping that someone would pay attention to poor little open source. And there were always two, there were two camps, one that said open source will destroy Microsoft, and the other that said Microsoft will destroy open source. And neither of those scenarios was ever going to be true. Um, the reality is that all of these, you know, business models are subset of sustainability models, right? What matters is, is increasing access to education and increasing quality of education. As long as um, folks like Flat World and folks like you continue to produce good quality open educational resources under, a light, uh, under a, the right license and, and are finding sustainability models, 
the market will move. It will become easier for your foundation to share OERs, and sooner or later, and I guarantee you every single one of these big publishers is having conversations privately, internally, about how to respond to OERs, how to, what's the right way to embrace this, how do we continue to operate, and the, and the smart ones are gonna realize that they're not, of, they're not textbook companies, they're education companies, and we've got plenty of challenges we can take on together. But I, you know, I think for those of you who are feeling uh, discouraged or overwhelmed by the big guns, if you look at not only so open source software, but also what's happened with record companies, what's happened with you know any other proprietary content industry, history is on your side. Thank you. Those are great comments. I agree with those. Um, yeah. Yeah. I just <clears throat> uh, one of the things that I've seen with the Kaleidoscope Grant and I worked with the Kaleidoscope Grant as an instructional designer, is that uh, there's a culture that knows how to adopt a commercial textbook. And so I think that one of the attractions of flat world knowledge is it's more comfortable for institutions to say, we recognize what that dressing looks like. Yeah. Um, what's happened with things with like the Kaleidoscope Grant, which is, is very significant, is that the Kaleidoscope Grant isn't about generating content. It's about how you adopt this content. And so there's um, the, one of the ways that the grant was working was it was bringing people from different institutions together to talk about their needs, talk about their student learning outcomes, and then putting together the content that meets that. So it's coming out of a community rather than out of a commercial, commercial publisher. One of the other things that you got with Kaleidoscope was someone that was advocating for the OER, right? I mean, when we had the question about the psychology course, what Cable did was put you in the position of going back and advocating for this. In your spare time, you're not teaching five sections of psychology. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm a very good advocate. I'm a big mouth, and I have a problem. And I'm full time, and he'll probably let me do it. But I know other people might not have that. And so they get giving some thought to what kind of resources we provide as a community to folks that are going back and needing to do this type of advocacy would be useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd like to touch on that one for a second. Um, I was Rich Crandall, I'm the Senator over Education for the State of Arizona. And I'm, I'm curious, a couple of different approaches to that question. <coughs> if we had an email conversation. Yeah, I was going to say. I'll talk after this. It will have some policies. But, there's two different ways. One, if a, if a college in Arizona has a policy that says, no, you can't go OER, we simply want a law that says you must. You know, and we've done that with K-12 forever. Yeah. But are you seeing uh, policies that either incentivize, the, well, there's two different routes. Do you see policies that states have that, that restrict the use of OER, and then do you see any states that incentivize OER? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a a better answer to that. I don't see a lot of <coughs> policies restricting OER, explicit, uh, restrictions on the adoption and use of OERs. What I what I actually see much more is a lot of ambiguity and uncertainty. And so what it is, it's, it's almost the lack of the opposite that's causing the problems. A lot of faculty don't know. For, so we get the question all the time, for example, um, you know, is, is this business book that you've published going to be certified by the AACSB, which is a certification body, or will the, will the credits for this course transfer to another institution if we use an open textbook. And the truth is there's zero certification of a Pearson textbook today, and there's no uh, transfer guidelines around a textbook. It's all history, right? It's brand. And, and so, um, but the lack of that history and brand recognition and acceptance creates uncertainty and doubt in the minds of faculty about their ability to, to adopt it. So I think there's a, a vacuum, actually, is the bigger problem than I see there being policies restricting the adoption of. So we probably don't have enough policies encouraging, in, in carrots, encouraging the adoption of to get more points of light established out there, if you will. It feels like the bigger issue to me right now, but any other well, responses Pearson is, that? is a huge employer in Arizona, so we're right. going to screw it all the other. Right. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. I work at the same college as Amber, and we actually have an advantage that the president of our, of our college, a year and a half ago, actually promoted the concept of open textbooks for our school because he knows that 50% of, and I think, the, I think the percentage is higher now, but at that time, 50% of community college students were not buying textbooks. Right. And it's a retention issue. Right. We can't retain those students. Right. 
Right. You know, we have a, a problem, and I, this is one I get uncomfortable talking about, because we, at Flower World, we, we very much ally ourselves with faculty. Right? We, 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 they, they're the gatekeepers to these decisions, and we need to provide value for faculty to adopt. But that is the, the biggest conundrum right now. Right? It's, it's actually um, possible, I think, to get institutional support at the president level, at other levels of an institution, saying, this makes sense. You know, we have a crisis. We have a graduation crisis. We need to graduate a lot more students in, by 2020 than we're currently on a trajectory to do. And the biggest piece of that is attacking the cost spiral in higher education. And most components of that spiral are spiraling the wrong way right now, right? Tuition is spiraling up. Fees are spiraling up. And textbooks are, for community college students, a shockingly high percentage of their spend, right? It's actually the second biggest attackable piece of the cost spiral of higher education. It's a meaningful strategic lever for an institution uh, to pull in order to improve graduation rates. The problem is the institution doesn't control the adoption decisions. And there's a huge amount of historical sensitivity to the individual faculty's right um, to adopt whatever they want. So we have a very dispersed decision-making process. And, and, and as we all know, frequently when there's support of something at the top, there's almost opposition of it from faculty because there's some feeling that there's something behind this or this is a slippery slope. If we allow you to tell us we have to use open, then what's coming next, right? So, so there's a lot of rich challenge there, you know? And so we've continued to focus at the individual faculty level, but at the same time, we're starting to have top-down conversations that say, how do we create incentives for faculty? There is a switching cost. Can we create grant incentives for them over the summer? Can we figure out ways to take that out of the savings? Uh, the, the government, state and federal government, is paying a huge amount towards textbooks. And they're paying the top dollar because vouchers are generally only usable at college bookstores, which is the most expensive place to purchase a book. If you took that cost down from here to here and took out a sliver of the savings and turned that back to faculty to compensate them for their time to switch and adapt and, and improve materials, we might start to see some real movement. So I think there's some, some opportunities here for exploring policy that aligns faculty with the institution where everybody says, look, this is a crisis, a student crisis in learning, and we all have a role to address it. Um, but, but figuring out meaningful and scalable ways to, to do that at the faculty level, I think, remains one of the greatest challenges in this movement. Yeah, back here and then over up front. So real quick, Washington State has um, done a couple of things to apply some, um, some incentives to uh, faculty adoption of open, uh, openly licensed uh, materials and including textbooks. Number one, uh, so they jointly funded the Open Course Library, so that with the Gates Foundation, um, and uh, which is taking the top 81 highest enrolling courses and creating open, openly licensed uh, Creative Commons CC BY materials uh, for all 81 courses, including um, and those those courses. Um, can use traditional textbooks up to $30. And so, as you know, um, several of the textbooks are, are actually lateral knowledge books. Um, but the faculty were empowered to, to go in and, and actually have some of their time purchased, to, uh, bought out to, to be able to have the release time to, to go and, and create those resources, which, were, which are then shared openly. And the first 42 get, get launched on Monday, actually. So. Um, so we're excited about that. But the other piece is there were policy levers that were also pulled um, at, the, at the state level in the legislation. In the, in, in the legislation, for example, that recommends that um, there's legislation that recommends that faculty choose the least expensive of all comparable textbooks. And now that leg legislation includes the word open educational resources. So adding little things in at the policy level to sort of pave the way and say it's OK right. to go there. Yeah. Don't forget hey, the big, I, well, don't don't miss out on the big open one. policy. Yeah. <laughs> so the state board, the state board um, introduced an open policy saying, you know, any any optional grant money that comes through the state board, uh, you gotta you gotta openly license yeah. whatever gets created yeah. as a result. And so that's all, all, all good policies that encourage with, without requiring. Right. I, I'm with you 100 percent about not requiring. As soon as you start to mandate. Um, you, you've created a problem. Yeah. Now there may be steps, and then we're going to come up here to requirement. I and mean, I can see a pathway of carrots and sticks, right? A system that that can work without requirement and lead to some 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 tipping point or scale, right? So to, totally hypothetical, right? But I, I think incentives and grants for faculty, and then soft follow up, right? Lots of 
Um, I mean, it meant a lot in Ohio when the governor brought 10 faculty to the governor's mansion to celebrate their adoption of open content as teaching innovators, right? So, so once you get those wins, celebrate them. But in order to get them, I think providing some incentive makes a lot of sense, whether it's teaching, you know, on your teaching reviews, you get points for doing this, whether it's financial incentives that I think we have to be serious and very hard-headed about where to pay for those, because they're not coming out of <laughs> uh, budgets today, they have to come out of some savings that are going to be incurred here. Uh, but I think doing that is a, is, a, is a good carrot. I think there are some healthy sticks, quite honestly. I think if you're a public servant, um, being asked to at least write and document for the public record that you've considered and rejected open alternatives, um, and why, it is, is a perfectly valid thing to ask somebody to do. I think if you're a faculty member at a public institution, you have a public responsibility to spend tax dollar payers wisely and to educate students to the best of your ability. And no one's saying you have to use the open textbooks, but they're saying you have to at least acknowledge that they exist and why you chose not to use them. And I think that's a, it'll, it'll be a fight, but it's not, a, it's not an unfair fight, and it creates a huge amount of awareness instantly amongst faculty. Well, what are these things? And, and a need for education. Well, let me get up to speed on these things. And, and, and actually healthy pressure. If I'm going to say I didn't do it because they don't use the right Keynesian cross and aggregate demand and aggregate supply model in section 13 in chapter 4, and is that justifiable to ask for a $200 spend versus 20? If I feel good about that, I'll put it in the public record and I'll defend it as the gatekeeper of good education. But if I don't feel good about it, I'm probably not going to do it. And I think that there's some healthy combination of some positive incentives and some, some sticks that aren't mandates that could lead to a much more rapid uptake. And then I think we're going to see students actually, as I talked about earlier, exerting market pressure. Right? The Higher Ed Opportunity Act saying that an ISBN and the cost of a textbook needs to go in a schedule. We are already seeing when faculty put free textbooks in a schedule, it's like the giant sucking sound. That's where the students go. And that's going to create all kinds of tensions in the university um, that they're going to have to start to resolve. So I think there's ways to get to that tipping point. It's not entirely linear, um, but I think it's indeed uh, possible. Yeah. Uh, Rory McGrail, I'm from Athabasca University in Canada. And uh, um, what I see, I call it the Puttenhead Gilson phenomenon, where he wrote about the guy with the two heads, Mark Twain. And one head drank, and the other head got the hangover. <laughs> Part of the problem with faculty is they don't pay for the book. They choose the book, they don't even know the price of the book, and students pay for it. That's part of the problem. But we're, we are approaching the tipping point in Canada on this, and it has nothing to do with the price of textbooks. Is we're an open university, all our students are online. Our students are now using tablets and uh, mobile, small mobile devices. The world is going that way. The US will follow. I think Europe's going that way. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the point is this, is they get a proprietary textbook, uh, you can't buy it, you license it, you can't copy, you can't paste, you can't highlight, you can't print it out, um, they put a, uh, a, dead, uh, a kill date on it so it's, it disappears suddenly from your uh, uh, machine after. Um, uh, the licensing is if I show it to my wife, um, I must immediately take it off my computer and notify the company. Uh, I've, I've committed an offense. And they put in digital rights management and they're monitoring everything you do. You have no privacy and they have every right to do it. And on top of that, when you click on the license, you've agreed that you have no fair use rights. You've agreed to that. And, and the contract overrides your fair use rights. And our faculty are suddenly maybe beginning to understand it a bit sooner than others because you're still dealing with paper books. But the world isn't going to stay with paper books. We're going towards digital books. And we cannot work with proprietary textbooks. Mm -hmm. It just is impossible. You just try it. You just find out what your faculty are doing. They cannot do their job with a proprietary textbook. And I think that's the important thing well, that's changing that's, our faculties. Yeah, that's an important point. I think the you know, the, the cost is the driving issue now here around open. I think from our point of view, we strategically focus on that, although we tactically always continue to bring up your ability to adapt and to, to improve it and make it more relevant. But by default, as, as, we, as the form function shifts more digital, the barrier around being able to do anything with it becomes much more obvious and frustrating. And I think that those are all part of, uh, uh, where's our Cengage uh, friend here? all part of the big macro trends that are sort of putting history on our side here. 
Um, so we have five minutes left. Um, uh, where do we want to go here? It's been a good conversation. Um, we have more comments. We want to just continue in this vein? Oh, for a big question that we didn't get to yet. Yeah. Well, oh, well, all right, so let's do the big question, which is, uh, let's see. Uh, let's do uh, da, 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 that one. So let's finish our five minutes on this one. So opinions, refutations of that statement, supporting comments of that statement. Data, experience related I, to I that. I think OER supports business. It's a better business case in the long run. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you pointed out about the, the stability of it, um, I think it's real business. It's a marketable. What we have is a, sort of a, an oligopoly, a, a, a group of, of, uh, of companies, and they're controlling mm -hmm. the market. And this opens the market wide open. It does open it up. So does anybody have a, a point of view that says, I fundamentally think that the goals of uh, commercial activity are are really counter to the goals of the OER movement. I'll go there. Yeah, please do. We need a little. Oh, you want me to defend that? <laughs> <laughs> please defend that. All right. Um, geez, I'm not an economist. Or not. If you don't, I mean, no, 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 no. I want. We don't need to create an unnecessary debate if we're all in agreement. I'm not an economist, but basically, if you create an incentive, which in this case money, right? You know, that base, an incentive structure that basically says you have to maximize money. Then you're going to create a disincentive that's going to, you know, de-emphasize something else. Right. So anytime you say, well, here's a company, and ostensibly they they provide education or education support or education materials, you know, and their goal is to make money, then they're gonna then they're gonna say, does good for education, does good for money, I'm gonna pick money. Right. And so you've got to pull them out of it as much as possible, because the incentive in the education system should be for better education, right. not for somebody who will lie to you and say, no, no, I'm making this for education reasons. Right. Money reasons is what I'm really saying. But if less and less students are buying their book, they've got an economic problem. If they're given the right information, if they're offered the opportunity, but the problem is they're not, right? Because this entity that makes money can lobby Congress, can lobby faculty directly, can uh, lobby institutions, can do all sorts of things. I think they should, I think we should, Sweep the money changers from the top. Right, good. I like the uh, position saying we'll go here and then. Did you? Uh, no? Okay, so we'll go there and then see you. Oh, well, just I do think in some ways they are counter, like not counter, but like they can't always exist in the same space. I mean, look at Wikipedia. Like, if that was vigorously operated, it was like, you know, we're gonna we're gonna milk this for all we can. Wikipedia would probably die. Yep. So I mean, it is in some cases it's hard for them to just exist in the same space. They can. Maybe you can. So right. It's, it's, right. Oh, well, that's fair. Yeah. Um, oh, did you not? Sorry. I was on the list. Oh, no. oh, I'm sorry. I was in the red shirt, I had you, and then and then let's see what time we're at here. Well, so you're venture fund, and so you know what what you're I'm, I'm sure as you're pitching VCs, they're looking to extract the maximum amount of profit out of education right. that they can. That's why they're investing. Mm -hmm. The balance of that is there are a lot of things we don't do well. So to your previous point that. Um, that you know, when it comes to a commercial entity with all of these marketing dollars and all of this expertise, trying to affect change, how can a nonprofit ever hope to do that? If that, that's what it's taking in the flat world, and we need flat world to be using VC dollars to affect change. If you look across U.S. higher education institutions and, and look at what is the first enterprise application software, open source software that they adopted, they bought the Luminous platform from SunGuard and paid a license fee for it, and that was their path into open source. And they most likely went from there to Moodle. But if you look at Lehigh, they went from UPortal to Moodle to being an investing partner in Quality Library. So there's this kind of change that we're able to take, and, and even though the venture funding makes it complex, it does allow you to do things that education does not do well for itself. And education does not know well how to create broad adoption. Right. You know, that, that right. really does require some of the resources that you're pouring into marketing right. that have to happen if we're going to see this change take broad hold. Right. Or it'll be pockets of extremists with their crazy ideas doing interesting things that the rest of education will never benefit. So. so let's stop there because I think we're too eloquent 
arguments for both sides. Um, I, and I'll, I'll just conclude by saying, look, I think um, there's truth in both of those. I live in them every day, and it's not always easy, right? There, there's no question that the questions from the board come sometimes. Why do we have to have this open license anyway? Why can't we just do this? And, and I, but I think what's interesting, and this is where we all have to keep ourselves honest, is the minute I answer that question dishonestly, right, because of ideology or philosophy, is the moment I'm actually in trouble. Right? So when I can argue that there are business reasons why open is providing us an advantage because it's transferring value to our customers and this is our competitive advantage and that's why we have to hold the line on that, if that remains true, they'll keep answering that question, okay, I hear you. If I actually am saying it and it's not true, people don't value the open license, they don't do anything with the open license, they don't adapt content over time, it doesn't lead to improved learning outcomes, then, then this is going to run up against a wall at some point. And I feel like um, there, are, there are valid commercial arguments to say our interests are aligned, not always, um, but sometimes in ways that we can be effective, uh, but, but the underlying basis of it has to be true. So with that, thanks. This has been a fun session for me. I hope you guys have